All right, we're going to get started. Hopefully more people will come. I know there was a party last night. It's always tough to be after the party. So if everyone in here would do me a favor and email everyone who's not in here, that would be really helpful. Or text them or call them real time. I'll waive the, the no cell phone rule for the first five minutes if you want to call people, as many friends as you can invite in. Um, so we're going to get started. We've got a great lineup today. Thank you for coming to the second ISV Roundtable at Open Power Summit. How many of you were here last year? Oh, not Okay, we got a whole bunch of new people, which is great, and some people came back, which is good too. That means we did something, right? Um, how many people are involved in writing software applications for Open Power? Okay, how many people are involved in building hardware for open power? Okay. And how many people are selling solutions based on open power, but not necessarily developing? Oh, cool. So that's kind of what I've been seeing. I've been seeing that was roughly a one-third, one-third, one-third mix, which is a big difference from last year. Last year um, was a lot of hardware people, obviously. The ecosystem was young, but we've seen a lot of activity and a lot more progress in, in growing the ISV community. So that's really good to see. <clears throat> and it's good to see everyone back. So thanks again. Um, I'll tell you a little bit about myself. I'm Randall Ross, and I'm an Ubuntu community manager. I work for Canonical, uh, which is the company behind Ubuntu. Uh, Canonical is involved quite heavily in the Open Power Foundation. We're a platinum member. We joined very early on. Our, our vice president is uh, chairman of the board. Uh, John Zanos, you probably heard him speak yesterday. And I head up um, one of the work groups in the Open Power Foundation. I lead the, I, sorry, the Integrated Solutions Work Group. And I'm also a member of the Technical Steering Committee. So I have pretty good visibility on what's going on in the foundation, what the different work groups are doing. So if you have any questions about work groups, foundation, et cetera, I can certainly answer those. Um, my role as an Ubuntu community manager is to grow the power community as big as possible and to have fun while doing it. So this is going to be a little less formal than some of the uh, other sessions you've seen. I try to keep things fun, loose, and exciting. So uh, hopefully uh, you'll benefit from that and uh, enjoy the session a little bit more. So I originally entitled this presentation, The Open Power Community is Awesome. And I, I put that as a placeholder, thinking, oh, I'll, I'll put that in, I'll replace that later, thinking that's just kind of a hokey title. But then the more I thought about it, the more I thought I really wanted to talk about why the open power community is awesome. So I've talked to many of you, I've, I've talked to a lot of people who are not in the room throughout the year, and what I can say is the level of passion I'm seeing in this community is very, very high. I haven't seen a community this energized in a long time, so I'm very excited to be here and be amongst you and help build this enthusiasm in any way I can. So community enthusiasm aside, I'm also seeing a lot of new developments, a lot of new resources for different aspects of the community. Uh, we have resources for developers, operators, solution builders, more solutions coming. So the energy level is going up and up and up. So when I say the, the community is awesome, it's a mix of projects, products, and people. And I think we should keep that in mind that it's, it's not just the, uh, the product and projects. So thanks all for being an awesome community. Today's discussions, we have um, 12 speakers lined up today. And they all have a different story to tell. They come from different backgrounds, different companies. And some of the, I won't parse this slide, but some of the themes for today are on this slide. So you'll hear, if you're interested in any of these, you're in the right session. So you're going to hear some really interesting new developments in the open power community. And I'm not going to steal the thunder of any of the speakers. I'll let them dive into it. But this is, this is what we're here to do. As a reminder, um, if you could, if you do have a Twitter account and you're able to tweet our hashtags at the bottom, that would be really helpful in spreading the word. Um, open Power Summit is our hashtag. So by all means, uh, take photos of us, tweet, send, all, send it to all your friends, journalists, people who can make a lot of noise, and we'd really appreciate that. I like this picture because I think this represents the Open Power community. Think of this as a playground. 
a playground where we all can build things together. It's kind of like a giant Lego kit, very colorful, a fun place to be. So as we're going through these presentations today, let's keep that in mind. We're here to learn, we're here to have fun, and uh, let's, let's keep it light and informative. So I want to thank you again for coming, and I'm uh, going to introduce or bring up the next speaker, and then we'll get started. All right, next speaker, please. And I have this trick question that I ask all the speakers, so this is going to be fun. Come on up. So, oh, I still need live mic. Sorry, I should have said that. So, um, what excites you about the open power community? Yeah. Use my, okay. I think that's the, the most excites me is uh, because I'm from IBM Research. So the using the open power community, we can, uh, with the industry, we can have more opportunity to, to develop the good technology around the power architecture because open the whole door to the whole world. Great, thank you. And I'm gonna turn it over now. Thanks thank very much. Thank you, thank you for this question. Okay, um, okay. so uh, today, um, I'm from IBM Research, and uh, uh, this presentation, I have the, invited my colleague Guang Cheng, He's also from IBM Research to do, do this joint presentation together. Okay, okay, today's topic we bring here is about the porting. So uh, when the, any uh, new developer, new company, or new customer, they want to touch the open power, maybe the, always the first question they will ask is, how can I port my current x86 code onto the open power platform? Okay, so this is about our presentation. Today we want to bring the, or introduce this tool to help you to do this automatic porting from x86 to power. This tool is developed by IBM Research together with IBM Power Product Team. We spent more than one year to have the first version of this tool come out. Okay, uh, let me share some experience with you. Uh, because I have worked for power for more than 10 years. And uh, usually for one popular the community, such as FFmpeg in multimedia, or DPDK, very popular in NFV, we need to dedicate have one contributor into the community to finish all the porting uh, for the power big Indian or little India, and also the, to catch up the different release. If the community, they come out a new release every Every, tw uh, every two months or every year, then we need to dedicate the person to catch up the updates in the community. So, but today when we look at the, the GitHub, there's more than 20 million open source projects in GitHub. If we still are using this human way to do that, it's impossible. So, uh, because IBM already uh, bring up the cognitive computing, so we also want to see if there are any possibility to build a robot to help you to put the x86 code in, onto power without or still today have less or less effort for the human, for the developer. So this is the goal. This goal is to help you to do the porting from open source project from x86 to power. Okay, I might skip some technical details. If you have interest, you, we can discuss offline, but the main idea is to, to put the, the DevOps together with the cognitive computing technology together to finish this technology and finish this code. Okay, so when we talk about the auto port, we have two important keywords. One is automatic, the second one is cognitive. What means for automatic? Uh, later, my colleague Wang Cheng, he will give you very simple the step by step the demo. But in, in simple, automatic means the user, they can select any open source project from, from our tool. The project can be the open source project from GitHub or from other source. Then the system will help you to automatically download this project source code and uh, automatically deploy it onto our open power cloud. One set will be deployed onto the x86 machine and the other set will be deployed onto the open power machine. And we will automatically prepare the environment for different operating system options. For example, Ubuntu, for example, Red Hat or Fedora, different options. It can be selected by the user. 
and it will auto, automatically help you to install the uh, dependence libraries. Yeah. So these all the things will be done by automatic way. The second is the cognitive. We will do the text analytic uh, for the, all the build, uh, build script uh, for, uh, of this open source project. But today, to be honest, uh, a lot of open source projects, when they prepare the build script, still only consider the x86 architecture. So we will do the automatic passing and generate a new build script for Power Platform. And also we will do the automatic analysis for all the test results. We will build and test for both platform in, in, at the same time and compare the result for the platform at the same time. So it will be easily for the user, they can get the result for power and x86 and we will deliver the test result to the user. So they can very easily to know, okay, if this project runs and uh, uh, built and runs onto the power correct or not. Yeah. So later you will see the demo. Okay, currently this autoport project we already uh, launched it in uh, last month, in the middle of last month. Uh, it is launched on the Supervisor Cloud. Um, Supervisor Cloud is the open power cloud de de developed and uh, operated by IBM Research today. It is the free nonprofit cloud. Uh, the, the target is to help to uh, help the open power developer and also the partner, the companies, if they want to learn and try some new technology there. So we launched this service on Supervessel and uh, you can try it for free, yeah. So the URL I put onto this slide is the URL for Supervessel. Okay, uh, this is another important thing that also in the last month, we open source the whole Autoport project onto GitHub. And so today, you can go to this link to see the, all the code of Autoport on GitHub. Because we believe still, uh, if we really want to have an ideal robot, a lot of knowledge still they need to put there. So that we want to encourage the whole community to work together with us, the whole community of open power, whole community of the different uh, the, the different uh, uh, domains, so that uh, in one day, we can really have the very, very automatic robot to help us to solve all the important issue, and uh, it can speed up all your business. Okay, so my short presentation will stop here, then I will invite Guang Chen to give you a quick step-by-step -step viewing. Yeah. Okay, thank you everyone for coming. Uh, I will go through the a uh, step-by-step uh, procedure to to use the to use the the, the autopod service uh, as you mentioned uh, the autopod service is already launched on Supervisor. you could get you could see a link on the Supervisor uh, homepage uh, to the to the autopod service just to click the button you will be in the dashboard of autopod service uh, when you log in the autopod Dashboard. The first thing you you will need to do is to launch a cluster. The, the cluster of the Autopod service will will include uh, quite a few nodes uh, with different uh, hardware architecture and the Linux flavor combinations, and also the Jenkins uh, the Jenkins infrastructure. The cluster launch will take a while, probably less than one minute, because all of these uh, these instances in the in the backend are, are, are Docker containers. It's very quick to launch. Uh, once the cluster is launched successfully, you will get a link to the uh, to the autopod portal. This is uh, what the autopod portal looks like. Uh, the first tab in the portal is the search. You could search a project name or the keyword uh, of the project in the uh, uh, on the GitHub. Once you in, uh, for now we are using uh, we are using the G, uh, the Java unit as the as the example. Uh, once you click the search button, uh, auto post service uh, we are in the back end fetch the. Uh, the, the source code and the configuration files of the project and uh, and uh, analyze them. In most cases, uh, 
you are you are ready to go through just clicking the the build and and the test uh, a button. But if you want to uh, customize the build environment further, like I want to select the specific Java version I want to use, or specify uh, or specify which of the 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 code of the software I I want to use, you could customize them through the through the buttons. Once you press uh, once you press the the build and test. Uh, the job will be submitted to the uh, to the to the nodes uh, uh, in the cluster. It uh, depends on the on the software size and the complexity. Uh, the the build and test process may be uh, several minutes or even longer to something like one one hour. Uh, uh, after the build and test are done, you will be able to see the to see the result on the on the on the reports tab. If you want to see more details for the uh, uh, for this job, you could select the select the entry from the list. You will see the test result of the of the build. You will see how many test cases are run, how many are succeed, how many are failed. If you want to see even more details about the the, the build and, and the test log, you could click the the build and and the, and the test log on the link, and uh, you could. Uh, you could also see the see the build and, and the test log in in, in the comparison uh, on the uh, on the different nodes. This is uh, this is used for especially when when the uh, when the build are successful on some nodes but uh, but failed on some other nodes. You could compare the the build uh, the, the build log to get some uh, some better uh, understanding of what was going wrong. Okay, so thanks for Guangcheng. So. Uh, the last several uh, sentences is, uh, please try it. And uh, on Supervisor, we have the email address, or the, you, you can, we can exchange the uh, business card uh, after my talk, and so that uh, you can get uh, more detailed information. And uh, imagine that uh, today is only the problem about uh, how to port uh, from the architecture of x86, x86 to Power, Power 8. But uh, for whole, the whole open power, uh, our roadmap is the power eight and power nine, and uh, further, further, there will be a new architecture come out. So we hope that uh, the in future, the porting from one architecture to the other architecture to help the open power is not a problem anymore. So the, uh, I really appreciate that you can try this too and feedback us, and also to have some contribution together in the open community in the GitHub. Okay, thank you. Okay, thank you very much. Uh, I'm gonna bring our next speaker up on stage for the trick question. Oh, no. Does anyone have a suggestion for the trick question? If you're tweeting, you can get my good side, right? Here's my good side. <laughs> so my trick question is, why does the open power community matter? Why does the open, so I have a mic, so. <laughs> why does the open power community matter? Um, well, Randy showed a photograph of, of a playground with people in the background around a, around a play set uh, and a child with presumably his father on the, on the front, on the foreground. The open power community matters because um, that part of the picture to me uh, illustrated some mentorship uh, and some training that goes on as part of the open power community. So you're sharing your knowledge with, with the community, with the next generation, and things like that. So awesome. Yeah. Thanks, Lance. I'll let you get to and it. And that really was a trick question. He didn't. He didn't say he was going to ask that. <laughs> so uh, I'm here to talk a little bit about uh, uh, building blocks for ISVs and how uh, independent service vendors or software vendors can uh, play a role in the open power community. Um, I'm from IBM. Uh, I work in the CAPI enablement team. Uh, as a subject matter expert, I go around talking to different uh, uh, groups about how to create accelerators in the CAPI environment, about how to create uh, their libraries and things of that nature. Uh, and so let's talk a little bit about um, open acceleration. Uh, we just kind of picked a couple of things. Uh, as you saw yesterday, there were 50 some odd announcements uh, in the open power uh, space. Um, and I picked just two. Um, that weren't really, uh, the first one isn't really part of the big announcement, but uh, as part of the Open Power Foundation, one of the things that was standardized over the last year was the coherent accelerator interface architecture. So that's part
part now uh, of the domain of the Open Power Foundation. So if you want to guide the evolution of the coherent uh, interface architecture, uh, you can join the, uh, the architecture work group uh, and you can play a role uh, in the future evolution of that architecture. Uh, one of the other things that, that I kind of found interesting was uh, this uh, uh, system that Rackspace created, this barrel eye system as part of the open compute uh, platform. Uh, and I thought that was kind of interesting because Rackspace as a cloud service provider uh, can now stand those up uh, for you as ISVs to uh, leverage um, open power, uh, accelerators uh, and things like that and create solutions for the marketplace. Uh, so now when we talk about taking accelerators to market, I hope I don't push this over the edge, that would be bad. Um, the, we think of it in kind of three ways, I guess is one way to put it. Um, there's this building block layer, right, where you create an accelerator, you create more or less uh, of an API for it, uh, and you might think you're done. Well, okay, as a hardware designer, yeah, maybe you are. <laughs> but that doesn't necessarily get you out in the marketplace. Uh, and so what you need is applications to leverage uh, that accelerator. Uh, and so that's, that makes you more of a solution. Even further to the solution side, if you're going to try to scale out uh, an application, you might actually consider creating uh, a standard config, a rack with servers, with uh, storage, with uh, networking. Uh, and things of that nature. So we, when we think of the, the, the two market models, there's different layers uh, that you can try and take your, your solutions to market. Um, more on that uh, topic, when we're thinking about the accelerator, um, we're thinking it in, in kind of three different ways. Right? One is to look at the accelerator and try and create something that's transparent. And what we mean by transparent is the functional API that you create for the accelerator is the exact duplicate of some other API, um, libz, uh, the BLAST library, uh, and I'm making these up as I go, right? And so if you've, if you've created an accelerator that implements those, that API, that makes it easy for somebody to integrate the accelerator uh, with their application that uses that library. So that's one layer, we call that transparent. Um, another layer is uh, where there's some integration required. Uh, here's a case where the person creating the accelerator has really created something pretty new or new enough and different enough that the API is not the same or it's something completely different. Uh, and that's an area where an application might benefit from this acceleration service, but it takes work to integrate that application because you had to utilize this new API and things like that. Uh, and then the full solution, of course, is standing up the software in a rack and all that good stuff. So you provide the whole service, right? Uh, to, from the beginning to the end. Where the ISVs come, uh, come into play and are important in this is where can, they, uh, where can they play a role, right? They can play a role in the creation of the libraries, the tuning of the libraries, the organization of the library to make them more or more transparent uh, if it's possible. Uh, another space where ISVs plays is in the application space, right? They may have their own applications. They may see from the list of building blocks that oh, look, here's something that, that I could actually leverage in my application space. Uh, and finally, ISVs are great at, at pulling together full solutions, right? They take all the different pieces and pull them together. Uh, and so with that, I'm gonna put this chart up. I'm not gonna talk to it very specifically, but there's a list of, of um, accelerators that are transparent, that require integration, that are full solutions. Uh, that we've been working with uh, over the last uh, 12 or 18 months. Um, the, in the terms of the full solutions, right, we've got genomics processing, which is the Edico uh, Dragon uh, product, uh, graph analytics, uh, fuzzy, fuzzy search, and so on. So those are people who've gone through the work of creating a full stand-up solution. Um, in the middle is integration required, where the API is a bit different, um, or, uh, or maybe it's super thin, right? As we have an API for CAPI accelerators, it's called LibCXL. It's really thin, <laughs> open, attach, free. <laughs> there it is. <laughs> um, uh, there's more, but it's, those are the three big ones. Uh, so you can actually create an accelerator with that really super thin library. Uh, and that's where, that's where an ISV comes into play where you go, okay, that was really easy, that was a really thin API, but 
um, it's really not very useful in terms of an application programmer space. Uh, and then over on the transparent side are things that have that have act that have uh, libraries that actually match up with their with their counterparts in software uh, and things like that. Um, so what I'd like to close with um, is if you're an ISV or if you're a building block uh, acceleration builder is come talk to us. We'd like to try and hook people together from the ISV space with the building block space uh, and try and get more things toward the full solution side uh, and uh, take things from there. So I will stop here. And I'll close with my good side one more time, just for tweets. <laughs> Thank you, sir. Thanks. Yep. Oh. Does anyone have a oh, round of applause? <laughs> um, does anyone have a question for Lance before we move on? Oh, we can always re mic him. There'll be time for QA later, but I wanted to check in case something was fresh on your mind. I'm going to bring up our next speaker. Mm, trick question time. Are you nervous? No. Okay. Fine. That was the trick question. Yeah. Yeah. What, what, what is, uh, what's one of the coolest things you've seen in the open power world? Well, we're relatively new to this uh, open power community, but the thing is, is that we've been invited with such open arms and that we're just really excited to see what could happen if we built this relationship with this community and where we go from there, so. Great, thank you for coming all the way from Belgium. Yeah. So. Good morning, everyone. Uh, my name is uh, Thomas van Oven. I'm actually a PhD student at Ghent University, Belgium. And, um, but today I wanted to talk to you about a platform we developed at Ghent University, uh, which is being um, deployed into a spin-off right now, which is a Tango platform. So during my PhD, I actually uh, saw that time is a very valuable <laughs> resource. And, um, the thing is, we, we tend to focus on the execution time and getting that execution time down as fast as possible. But a lot of researchers and industry partners uh, at our university actually have an issue where we lose a lot of time even before that. And there's three bottlenecks that we uh, have identified where time is lost and uh, we're not able to get it back at this point. So first is time lost on discovery. With big data, you have all these uh, technologies out there both for analysis and uh, for uh, storage um, that you're not quite sure okay so which technology is actually useful for solving my problem which will get me the best performance in the end um, and what do I need to choose what do I need to use and so on and if you thought that the previous slide had a lot of logos already this is more complete image of the cloud uh, environment at this point with all technologies and companies active in the cloud and having solutions in there as well. So secondly, we have the time that's lost on installation because we have these distributed technologies for, perform, uh, for analysis and for uh, storage and you always need to install them on your own servers or on a public cloud and so that takes installation time, the distributed setup takes a lot of configuration, takes a lot of time, there's a lot of people involved and uh, it's not that easy to get uh, things up and running really fast. And then finally, once you have this awesome big data framework set up, you need to make sure that your data gets to your big data framework and you need to make sure that the information that you retrieved from the big data framework, that you're able to view that in, a, in any visualization tool or just get it into another system you're already using. And so we wanted to bring that data back, uh, bring the time back on your side, and that's why we created the Tengu platform. And I like to compare Tengu to uh, Lego big data sets. So we provide you with all the building blocks you need to start your own big data framework, get it up and running real easily, and you don't have to worry about any installation, any configuration, and uh, integration with all the different tools you might have running at that time. So, with, as with, big, as with uh, Lego blocks, you have two approaches. I mean, you have the approach of building according to the booklet that's delivered with your Lego, uh, with your Lego uh, blocks, or you can just go on a free build. And at this time, we only uh, provide you with the booklet approach, but we wanna 
uh, give you the full freedom of having those blocks at your disposal and just build freely. For example, if you want to build this streaming analysis, you might want to use Storm and get your information back into a MongoDB. But you want to focus on your business intelligence. So you want to focus on writing the algorithm in Storm, writing the Storm topology, and you don't want to worry about the technologies that are needed to make sure that the connection from an entry point to your Storm topology is made and that your Storm topology posts the data correctly into your MongoDB. So what Tengu does is actually detect that there's no way to, well, no direct way to um, interact from Storm to that entry point, so we make sure that uh, for example, a Kafka published subscribe system is uh, introduced uh, between uh, the storm uh, topology and your entry point for your data. Which means that you have a lot of freedom to build any kind of big data framework you like. And for example, this is uh, a big data framework that's getting really close to uh, the Lambda architecture. And the Lambda architecture is actually a hybrid model where you use both batch analysis and streaming analysis to make sure that you have a full historic view on your data set, but also have a streaming real-time feedback on what's happening in your system. And we actually wrote a paper about it because with Tengu, you're actually able to, um, to develop a Lambda architecture independent from the technologies you're using for uh, the batch layer, the views, or the speed layer meaning that we have a template and you just need to fill in the gaps. You just focus on what you want to use for your analysis, for your storage, and we'll make sure that everything gets set up and that the synchronization between those layers is all taken care of. And of course, the only way for us to do that in a very easy and dynamic way is to use Juju. So we've been using Juju as a core technology and Juju is our service orchestration tool to make sure that everything is deployed and will deliver all the bundles. We'll make sure that the bundles are completely configured and then uh, transferred onto Juju. And using LXC containers, we can actually quickly uh, switch between different big data frameworks. So for example, if you have this quick test set up and you want to make sure that everything is okay, but you see, okay, this MongoDB is not performing really well, you can just switch out the MongoDB and transform it into Cassandra uh, data store with no problem, and uh, the Tango platform will take care of everything. So we actually set out, since we're using these LXC containers, uh, we wanted to try something out with having multiple uh, Hadoop uh, clusters on one, um, clusters of, uh, one cluster of servers. So meaning that we have two full Hadoop clusters running on the same, well, the same hardware. Um, so this is like an approach to easy multi-tenancy because everything is uh, uh, shielded off from each other. But of course we have the overhead. So if we have just one Hadoop cluster running, uh, we have this uh, TerraSort benchmark that's uh, performing. So the one above says is like our baseline for, uh, for our results. And then we have two isolated um, uh, containers running, which takes, of course, a, a little bit more time because of the overhead we generate. And then we have two competing uh, containers as well, uh, meaning that they have no limit on what resources they're able to use from the hardware. Um, and what we see is that, so we have a little bit of overhead for the isolated and the competing one, of course, less for the isolated. But what we want to test now is actually for, uh, in the open power community, we expect that with the power architecture, we're actually able to get that overhead down even more easily, meaning that we could create a very easy multi-tenancy without, without all the complexity for tests uh, in your big data framework uh, on the power architecture. So I'm not gonna say match made in heaven, maybe, we'll see. Uh, we want to test that out, of course, in the future with uh, the help of the open power community and making sure that you have all the capabilities and all the power of your big data in your hands and without losing too much time. So Merlin is here with me. He's one of uh, the developers also working on the Tengu platform. Gregory is a postdoc at our Ghent University. He's also part of uh, the Tengu team. And um, yeah, if you have any questions, uh, you can come see us. We'll be hanging around after uh, the session here. Uh, we'll have a trial license soon, meaning that you can use Tengu in uh, your own environment or in our managed environment in a beta program. And uh, you can find more information on our uh, website, which is tengu.io. Thank you.
All right. Thank you, Thomas. Great speech. Um, I now have Adam on stage with me. I'm going to ask a question. I hopefully, it won't be too hard. Um, what have you seen in the uh, machine learning space that is really, really exciting? Uh, more hardware, the better, right? So the more cores, uh, the more compute, uh, the more you can do. Uh, so especially, you guys have heard of this deep learning thing, right? I think it's all just outside. Uh, power benefits from deep, uh, deep learning benefits from power, right? Great. So Take it away, obvious. thanks. Yeah. All right, so I'm Adam, the co-founder and CTO of SkyMind. SkyMind is deep learning for enterprise. So we help companies build deep learning solutions. So what is deep learning? Deep learning is a subset of machine learning. Uh, there's a lot of hype going on right now. Uh, again, it kind of permeates this conference. Uh, but in reality, it's a subset of machine learning. So machine learning in and of itself is just pattern recognition. Uh, that's predicting housing prices. Uh, this is, that's a cat. That's a dog, right? You know, a lot of applications uh, at GTC have all been uh, computer vision oriented. And that's what you typically see with deep learning. In reality, it's breaking records in a lot of other things besides computer vision. It's also breaking records in, in audio, in natural language processing, as well as just structured data. In our case, we focus on anomaly detection, finding the needle in the haystack. Uh, so in this case, recommendation engines, ad tech, among other things. The thing is, though, is it's computationally intensive. So that's, that's what prohibits a lot of organizations from deploying deep learning solutions today. So power changes that. Power allows us to scale easier. And with new technologies such as NVLink, enabling GPU compu compute with open power, uh, that gives us the ability to easier, easily deploy deep learning solutions. So use cases, uh, it's not academic anymore. Uh, everybody wants you to believe it's academic. You know, there's a lot of papers that get published, a lot of noise in the market. But we're, here's the thing. We're beyond multi-layer perceptron now. We're doing more than just the thing you learned in the 1980s. Uh, but a lot of people are afraid to tackle these, uh, to tackle these newer architectures. In reality, we're, re we're actually ready to start leveraging deep learning for real use cases. Ad tech. So ad tech has been the primary investor in deep learning for a number of years now. Uh, Google bought DeepMind for 600 million. Uh, MetaMind was just acquired by Salesforce. That's as enterprise as it gets, right? <laughs> um, so if you think about it, you, we're, we're entering a new age where deep learning as a way of automating uh, pattern recognition, uh, basically identifying core occurrences of patterns in data. We, in, we are actually enabling new solutions uh, with more automation. So in our case, now another one, recommendation engines. So e-commerce is a great use case for deep learning. So in the, you know, think, about, uh, think about Amazon. Uh, did you know every time you click uh, a button on Amazon, you're using us? Actually, Deep Learning 4J, our open source framework. Um, so we're being used in recommendation engines, augmented search, among other applications. And then our core use case that we're deploying a solution for is anomaly detection. So this can be fraud in FinTech, or it can be network intrusion in data center infrastructure. So Deep Learning on power. Uh, so two things that typically aren't seen together right now, but I think, especially with IBM backing it, you will start to see a lot more of this. Uh, the Open Power Foundation also has NVIDIA, which also kind of lives and eats and breathes deep learning, right? So basically, the, the goal of power is to have higher throughput for big data clusters, right? So there's a lot of solutions out there for big data. Most of them have ran on Intel hardware until now. And what we're going to start to see in the, next, in, the, in the coming years is a lot of compute moving to the GPU. And in this case, with power, more RAM, more high, and higher throughput, and being able to actually ETL data faster, right? So extract, transform, load. So that's actually 80% of data science, is just having pipelining data the right way. So uh, I think that's represented by our, my, the previous presenter at Ten, Tengu, right? So there's all sorts of crazy interrupt that needs to happen. Uh, and you, need, you typically need a big data platform of some kind. So power and hardware acceleration allow us, and more RAM gives us the ability to complete workloads faster. So in this case, massive amounts of cores. So we can actually even run this compute on CPU, right? So maybe, maybe you don't have a heterogeneous cluster. Maybe you're just now getting started with power. 
maybe you don't know, maybe your, um, your manager doesn't know what a GPU is and is a little afraid to buy, you know, acquire that kind of hardware. But maybe you know, it's safe to buy IBM. So maybe you go with power, right? So in a way, what we can do is either we can enable heterogeneous compute clusters to happen, and we can benefit from uh, power's more, more higher throughput as well as higher, higher RAM and whatever else you can think of. So the, the idea with deep learning, though, is the more data you throw at it, the better, the better it learns. So deep learning benefits from more data. More data is easier, more easily accessible with open power. So what I want to talk about is SkyMind's solution to this. We have an open source project called Deep Learning 4J. We are an open core company that focuses on building something called the intelligence layer. The intelligence layer is a new way of thinking about big data analytics frameworks. So the intelligence layer, we decouple the application logic from the actual prediction logic. So the prediction logic has things like loading data uh, make, and making prediction based on it, and then rendering that application for different kinds of users, right? So imagine if you have, imagine if you decouple all your services, and in, instead you focus on allowing your, enabling your users to just access different parts of the data. That's actually how Amazon Web Services was created. So we, we, we build on top of Hadoop and Spark, uh, and we, we, actually, we actually give Hadoop and Spark access to compute that is able to do hardware that actually has accelerated, hardware accelerated neural networks, either via open power or via CUDA. So what we do is we connect, we connect Hadoop and Spark storage to hardware accelerated neural networks that run on CUDA or open power. So what we do is we provide the intelligence layer the ability to load data in, make a prediction, and then render it for users. So this is a bundled solution that has hardware acceleration built in, as well as the ability to render predictions for users, and also enable real compute workloads via data pipelines, such as Kafka, or, or in this case, what one thing we're doing is Juju. Uh, so we will actually be co-presenting with Canonical at OpenStack Summit on a Juju-enabled uh, yeah, anomaly detection solution based on one, network intrusion, but also uh, identifying broken, broken nodes in OpenStack clusters. So we're actually ingesting raw logs on power and figuring out which machines break in a, in a, in a, in a larger compute cluster. Uh, so the short of it is Deep Learning 4J is our open source solution on CUDA and Spark, and, and then built on top of open power. Thank you. Thanks very much, Adam. I'm going to follow the next speaker up here. He won't see me coming. <laughs> so uh, I have a trick question for Bob. I think this might be the hardest one ever, given that our, our chairman is in the front row. No pressure. No pressure. What is the importance of the Open Power Foundation? So it's a good question. Um, we've listened to uh, this whole summit is a lot of technology and it's interaction between members to do technology, build better products. But the real value I see is really to the customer because the value is that all this technology actually takes the best of all the different companies and actually gives the best solutions and the best value to our customers that individual companies wouldn't be able to achieve. Thanks, Thanks very much. I'll turn the mic over to you. All righty. So along that line, all these presentations have been about technology and they're very good in how they interact and how you can use one piece with another piece to come up with a better solution. But what I'd like to talk a little bit about is more of a business view on this that says, why would you want to do that? And if you look at Open Power, Open Power was founded to, to really leverage the value of all the individual members to come up with the best possible solutions. But the other thing you can do is you can leverage the different members to go to market better and to have more access to market and have more customer base for your solution. And that's what I try to do on my team. So I work for IBM, I'm the offering manager for accelerator programs and solutions on power systems. So I try to take what you develop, and if it's on accelerators, I try to take it to market. So just because I'm not sure who our audience is all the time, 
I do accelerators. Up on the top there we have a couple of accelerator cards. These are from Nalatech and from Alpha Data. We have another one from Semtheon coming and we have other partners that are building the actual accelerator cards. They plug in a PCIe slot and any uh, socket on a Power 8 system can have two accelerators plugged into it, two PCIe. So that's Accelerators 101. If you have an application, and other people are gonna talk about this, My, the next uh, speaker is actually about performance on power. If you run your application on power, odds are you'll see an improvement in performance. If your application is performance sensitive, such as high frequency trading, where every second or microsecond or millisecond is dollars, then if you put it on an accelerator, odds are you're gonna see a much better improvement. And then if you use CAPI on top of that, you'll even see an another improvement. So all of these help give you a better solution in a time sensitive or performance sensitive application. So, oh, there we go. So why does CAPI work? This is the, again, the very basics of it. Uh, up at the top you can see, in order to do a typical I.O. model, there is many, many steps, many, many instructions, thousands of instructions. If you run it with a coherent model, and CAPI is coherent, accelerator, processor interface, means all the memory on the bus is coherent, you end up eliminating the device driver, you eliminate thousands of instructions, and you go from essentially 13 microseconds down to 0.36 microseconds, it's like 35 times faster performance. That's what you get. And we have websites and we have technical people here who can take you through every detail about how this really works and why. But the net of it is, it's faster and more efficient. So when you talk about accelerator solution development, uh, and Lance covered a lot of this also, but you have building block providers. These are guys who do algorithms, Monte Carlo, sort, encryption, things like that. Very fast, tuned, specific. But then you need ISVs, because ISVs will take that building block and they'll put a wrapper around it of code and an application and they'll take that Monte Carlo simulation and they'll tune it for the financial market. So they have an input and an output and they'll have a GUI and they'll have all the, and they'll customize it and they'll say, okay, what stock exchange do you want to input your data from? And they'll make that all into a complete wrapper with a solution. But as Lance pointed out also, and, and I'm gonna have a chart on the next chart, you need to put that possibly into a reference configuration and a, and a full solution. You put it in a Power 8 box, you put it with an accelerator car and a PCIe and you get the AFU and the accelerator loaded on that and some application and some software. That's where you have a business partner who will build that solution for you. And then you take that whole solution and you give it to the end customer. So, does this chart look familiar? It's what we talked about a minute ago where you have the accelerator with the AFU, the, the actual accelerator on the, on the chip you bring that into an application that an ISV writer will do, make, a, make an application out of that, and then you build it into a rack for a full solution. So my job as the offering manager here really is to leverage your technologies with our business partners and try to bring solutions to market, but also to create an environment that incents developers and ISVs to work with the open power community and why does that work? Why does that ecosystem work? So let's talk about the first two here in the, in the thing, the building block providers and the independent software uh, vendors. So for the building block and, and ISV developers, we have, a, have an ecosystem, a development ecosystem, and we've touched on this a little bit. We can give you access to all the specs and documentation. We can give you CAPI development kits. So uh, we've got three in the market right now. You go buy the development kit. It comes with the, the OpenCL or the other, or, or, a, uh, or SDXL or whatever to help write that code. And so you can build your application. We have the Super Vessel, which was talked about in the first, first presentation, but the, the no charge development cloud that you can go out, you can build the solution, you can try it, you can test it, you can port things. We have a uh, access to Poughkeepsie benchmarking centers and stuff. So you've got this great solution, but you want to demonstrate that it's competitive. So I can help you get access to the Poughkeepsie benchmarking center. We can run that solution against either industry standard benchmarks, or you can compare it against an x86, or you can compare it against other solutions, and you can demonstrate your value prop, which is what you need. When you go to market, you have to say, why does somebody want to buy this? 
What are your benchmarks? What are your proof points? And we can help you do that. We also have in Montpellier uh, and in Poughkeepsie, we have centers of competency. So as you go through this process, whether it's in the super vessel and they'll help you in the research department or whether it's through the uh, benchmarking and center of competency centers, these people will help you with technical questions, help you tune your application, help you get the most out of it. But there's a second side to this. There's the go-to-market resources that we provide. So we've got an open power, uh, a power website right now that just went live last Friday. And we list, and that's what Lance showed you, but we list all the accelerator applications right now, whether it's a building block or whether it's a full application or whether it's a full solution. We list them. We explain what they are. You get a chance if you want to list yours out there, which I recommend. You can put your application, or your solution out there. You can put your own PDF out there that describes what you want. You put a hot link back to your website so you can get contact information and how to buy it and how to purchase it. That's all available. I have a business partner channel. So many of you are, I'm going to guess, are cutting edge. Your startups, four people, six people, 10 people in your company. You don't have worldwide sales forces. You don't have service and support organizations. You don't have big marketing teams. You don't cover the globe, but you'd like to because you can sell a software license anywhere in the world pretty quickly. So with our business partner channels, we can introduce you into our business partners who are members of the Open Power Foundation. We bring your solution in. We create, with your help, a lot of your help, but we create reference configurations. We create collateral. We do training of their resellers and their sellers organizations so that they have knowledge of your solution, and then they go promote it. One of the re, uh, distributors that I work with has 12,500 resellers. How big is that? I mean, that, that's, that's like taking what you can do and multiplying it by, and they have, the other thing is we have access to maybe customers and markets through the Open Power Foundation that you might not necessarily be able to get with a phone call. And we can make those doors open for you to give your application visibility. So, and the last thing is, of course, uh, exposure to conferences, briefing centers, things like that. So out here right now, we've got DRC in the Xilinx booth because we're partnering with Xilinx. We partnered with DRC for their technology this time. But when we did SC15 in November, we had, um, we had uh, uh, two others in there. or We actually had five demos in there of different... Uh, different applications that we we're highlighting. All right, so that's the development side of this. But there's also why do the business partners and the end customers benefit this? Customers like to buy tested solutions. Customers like to buy things that have, are backed by large companies that have service agreements, things like that. So I'm not going to read this chart. It's very complicated and everything. But up in the blue is basically what we talked about for the building blocks. The building blocks are developed. Then you have a solution integrator, and he takes an ISV and an application. He puts it with a Power8 box. He puts the card in. He integrates that. Then he takes it to a reseller. That reseller is the one who actually goes out and does the selling to the customer. He takes that solution. He does installation. He does, he does uh, customization and things like that. So there's a whole pe group of people in this food chain that, that have to be arranged to make most of your solutions come true. So from a business partner, why do they want to do this? Well, selling solutions gives you higher margin services. So if you're a business partner and you're flipping hardware, hardware can be a commodity. But if you add integration services to put that all in a rack, if you add installation services down at the customer to, to install it, set it up, if you add warranty services, or if you take the service call, which is what many of you would like, is that you're in the software business, but you don't want to take the service call. So if the business partner will take the service call and determine whether that's a Power 8 problem or whether that's an application problem or whether that's uh, on the Nalatech card or the, or the actual card, and they do that triage ahead of time so you only get calls on stuff that's yours, that's worth something. It's worth something to them, too, because they charge for that. So they get to add high-margin services. The other thing that the business partner gets out of this is they get solutions. And with your help, they get all the marketing collateral, the sales training. The, they will run demand generation events. You can participate in those. And I also have the ability to do incentive programs to the distributors and marketing to um, incent them to sell accelerator solutions on power. Uh, let's click this. All right, I got two quick examples here. 
Um, we have an ISB with an encryption and text um, solutions. And what we have done with them is he kind of specializes in the, uh, in the intelligence community. And we got him in front of the IBM uh, client execs that handle some of the three-letter agencies and, uh, in Washington. And now he uh, presented. They were interested. Now he's running proof of concepts in one of those agencies, access. The second one, uh, we got a guy who has an image analytics solution. And he already had a proof of concept set up going on with a bank for bank fraud detection in London. But when I brought in uh, the IBM team who handled that client, that bank, and got them involved, what he was asking for was he was asking for fulfillment. Because he needed somebody to write all that application code around his building block, and he needed somebody to interface it into the bank and all that stuff. And I brought in the IBM GBS team. When they came in and saw his application, they said, you know, that you're only looking at one piece of the bank. And there's actually another part of the bank that has, actually has more money in their budget, and they could use this more. Would you mind if we introduced your solution to that part of the bank? And by the way, that person for the general business of services, she also handles other industries that does, does fraud detection. She said, would you mind if I introduced your solution to the insurance or teams that I cover, the insurance clients? So now all of a sudden, this guy has gotten from, from one proof of concept, he's gotten access now to other organizations within his initial client, and he's gotten access to other, other industries. So the point I'm on here is, within the Open Power Foundation, as you're coming to market, these resources are available to you, and you should leverage them, because it gives you more market access, more customer access, and it broadens your, and it broadens your awareness and your presence in the market. So, this thing is predicated first on the fact that, and, and people are already showing this, power gives you a competitive winning technology. It's power and it's the technology that you guys are bringing together. So that's a winning combination, it's competitive, it's easy to sell. Secondly, we make leading products out of it, we can provide routes to market for you, and we can increase your market segment and presence by doing that. And lastly, here's some, here's some uh, contacts and websites and stuff, you can get a hold of myself or others on this, and we can help step you and get you into this process. Thank you. Oh. Okay, See great you. job. No, it's the clicker. Well, we get switched over here. Need some help with the mic? Yep. So uh, I think I'll switch it up a bit with the questions, just to make things interesting. What brought you to Open Power? What brought me to Open Power? Great question. So my name is Alex Maricus. I'm the uh, chief engineer for Open Power Performance. Um, if you go back two years ago in 2014, I had just finished what I thought was the greatest accomplishment of my career. I just delivered, helped deliver the Power 8 processor. I was a performance lead on Power 8. Very proud of it. Very great um, um, uh, product. Brad McCready, who I'd known for a bunch of years, worked with him, was starting to pitch the Open Power um, idea. And after I heard it once or twice, I started thinking, you know, I think he's on to something. So I went to Brad's office and I said, Brad, I think you need a performance focus. He says, OK, you want to do it? And I was in. And uh, that, great, that's what got me story. into power performance. Yeah. So the moral is, be careful what you volunteer for. So. Yeah. <laughs> Welcome. I'm glad you're here. Thanks. Thank you. Take it away. So as I said, my name is Alex Maricus. I'm the uh, chief engineer for Open Power Performance at IBM. Uh, as I said, uh, my previous position was uh, doing Power 8 uh, performance. Uh, I'm going to talk to you about Open Power Performance. And this is not going to be a typical performance presentation. We're not going to go into a lot of speeds and feeds and talk about uh, uh, details about cache sizes and access uh, latency and bandwidth and stuff like that. I'll touch on those. We're not going into those details. If that's the type of details you want, you can either talk to me afterwards, find me in the uh, pavilion hall, or go find my hot chips presentation from when we delivered Power 8. What I want to talk about today is a very simple concept, and I, and I want to borrow on the opening uh, discussion. 
Open Power Performance is awesome. Open Power is an awesome platform for performance. So as you've already seen, and, and we're seeing a lot of this talking, Open Power has got an, an awesome ecosystem and is growing every day. Um, we, we have a lot of solutions that are ready today. It's growing every day. We, the number of members that we have is, is uh, uh, growing at a very dramatic rate across the whole scale, not just software partners, not just uh, chip partners, not just uh, adapter partners, but the whole uh, gamut. Uh, IBM itself has over 200 applications that are ready for, to run on open power platform. Uh, we've got over uh, 2,000 Linux ISVs uh, working on open power, and we've got uh, over 100,000 uh, open power, um, uh, op open source packages available. So we've got a great ecosystem. But what makes the performance awesome? And I have to admit, I'm missing a slide. So I have to do this from memory, and I hope I don't forget anything. Um, but I've done it enough time, so I, I probably get this right. What makes Open Power great for performance? Well, it's based on, on great hardware. And it, you know, as you could imagine, I'm proud of some of the hardware that Open Power is based on. Uh, the Power 8 processor uh, has strong cores. It, um, it has lots of hardware threads to allow you to parallelize your work across those strong cores. It has big caches to keep a lot of your, uh, your big data close. It has high bandwidth from the cache out to memory so that you can feed those caches in those threads. Uh, it's got a large memory, uh, efficient, large efficient memory subsystem so that you can feed the caches in the cores. And it's very friendly to acceleration so that uh, for workloads that might benefit from uh, either CAPI or GPU acceleration, uh, Power8 is very friendly for those. And I think I got them all. I hope I didn't miss any. But the open power ecosystem is also awesome for developers. We've heard a little bit from, from a, a few speakers today. Uh, you're going to hear some more after me. I hope you've been in the pavilion uh, uh, talking to some of our ISVs and listen to some of the presentations there. I'm going to touch on a few here. I'm not going to go over. Uh, we've got some great support for developers in the ecosystem. Um, we, we've, you already heard about the super vessel and how uh, developers can come and, and try IBM the, the cloud. Uh, we've got another uh, great program. Uh, it's IBM Developer Works, which is kind of a community-based type uh, support where there's blogs and white papers and there's forums. People can ask questions about, hey, I'm trying to do this on, on, on uh, open power and I've got some questions. Um, and then we have a couple of other uh, packages that I've listed. I'm not going to enumerate them all. But almost all of these on this page are IBM, because that's the ones I can find very easily. My hope is next year, one, I get invited back to give this presentation again, and two, most of that is filled with partner um, support for our developers. So Open Power today is a great platform. It's an awesome platform developers. And, and it's getting better. It's also an awesome, we also have awesome performance tools. So some of the ones, uh, and I'm going to just touch on a few of them. We have a, a package. It's an open source package. It's available to download for free called the Advanced Tool Chain. It has a, a power optimized GCC. Uh, typically, it's a little bit um, uh, earlier in the, uh, the, the tool chain than what you'd get in the distros but it's, uh, it's support that will eventually make it into a distro, as the name implies, advanced tool chain. You just get it a little bit earlier. We also have power optimized runtime libraries. These are the normal libc and stuff like that uh, that you get with Unix, but, but they happen to be uh, particularly optimized for power. We also have a great program, uh, packages called the Power SDK. I think there was, um, the, I think I, I saw a presentation on this in the, um, in the pavilion. Uh, it's a, a programming framework. It'll allow you to uh, bring your package in. Even if you don't have power hardware, it'll allow you to run it in a simulator. It'll profile it. It'll tell you where your potential problems are and some of your porting issues. Uh, in addition to the GCC compiler that we have uh, for free with our advanced tool chain, uh, you can also purchase our uh, Excel compilers, our high performance compilers, uh, C, C++, and Fortran. Uh, and there's also the IBM J Java. That, that's um, uh, available, high-performance Java optimized for the Power Platform. Actually, IBM Java is also available for x86. 
And uh, uh, a lot of times you'll see that the, the IBM Java for x86 outperforms some of the other um, Java that's available. So a great uh, Java platform. So, so at this point, I'm going to switch and just cover a few examples of based on the fact that we have great hardware, uh, that, that high performance, friendly for acceleration, we have great developer support, and we have great performance tools. Uh, I want to talk about, just give you a few examples of some of the performance uh, examples that we have. So everybody likes to talk, you know, hardware guys lo love to talk about spec int and spec float. So I got to put a spec int and spec float chart up here. So this is on our S822 LC, the two socket um, uh, open power system that we have. Uh, 10 cores per socket up against a similar uh, uh, x86 system, and we're about 30% uh, better on both spec int and spec FP. And, and I, I threw this in here, you know, spec int, spec FP are great workloads. Uh, this is not necessarily representative of any one workload, but it's a good start. And um, it shows that, uh, you know, we do pretty well, but, but we can do better on, uh, based on um, uh, various workloads. Um, I also said we're friendly for acceleration. You've seen some examples here. There are more examples that are going to be out in the pavilion. Um, you could take that S822LC and you could put uh, GPUs in it and you can accelerate your code um, over uh, almost seven times better um, by putting GPUs on it. And you can improve your uh, price performance almost 3x better by doing that. And not, not only does it do well compared to non-accelerated, but it also does well to other platforms using the exact same GPUs. So uh, as I said, uh, open power platform is, is uh, a, a great uh, platform for performance. And then lastly, uh, and there was a presentation on this in the uh, pavilion, the, I thought maybe the, um, the round table might be before it, uh, that talked about Spark performance, which kind of pulls everything together. Um, so I, I only picked out two uh, examples here. We have a single node example uh, of, of Spark running against 10, 10 workloads. We took the geometric mean, and um, we're, we're over 90% better than a uh, competitive uh, platform, single node. But nobody runs Spark on a single node. People run it clustered. So we built a cluster of uh, seven systems. Uh, we compared it to a uh, competitive system. And across the, uh, the suite, we were 70% uh, better on the cluster. And as you know, when you go into cluster, the CPU power doesn't matter as much. It's all the other stuff, the networking, the I.O., and stuff like that. So this just says our, our performance advantage scales as we go to more clusters. So I, I hope in this short presentation you've seen that uh, open power performance is awesome. Open power is an awesome platform for developing uh, uh, performance-oriented or applications. If you want some more information, um, as I said, I got the order of this wrong. I hope you saw the uh, presentation yesterday uh, in the, the, the Expo Theater on Spark Performance. Um, tomorrow, uh, I'm going to be around at the Plug Fest. So if you want to grab me, I think there are going to be some members of my team who are around. If you've you're got questions about performance tools or performance in general, you can stop by the IBM booth. Uh, if, if, one of, if I'm not around or somebody from my team is not around, the people in the booth will find us or afterwards uh, we can exchange uh, cards and talk about performance afterwards. Thank you. Great, thank you, great talk. So how's everyone doing? Yeah. Show of hands if this is exciting. I saw, I saw one hand go up. No, 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 I saw every hand go up, thank you. So on stage with me is Jeff, and I'm gonna ask Jeff a little, bit of a, a little bit of a twist here. Jeff, you were on stage last year. I was. And uh, in the time that has elapsed between last ISV Roundtable and this ISV Roundtable, what one thing would you say characterizes the community around open power, specifically software? So I would say that the, the biggest thing that I'm seeing is finally seeing some customer excitement. That's, you know, at the end of the day, I'm, I'm a strategic alliance and channels guy. So last year I was here, I was pretty green. I was an x86 born and bred person. So I was very new to this world. Um, but this year, now I've seen customers, big customers, big name, name brand, you know, Fortune 10 customers getting excited about open power 
and the, the platform, and that I think is the biggest difference, whereas I think it was just a lot of theory and college students excited and universities now, American Express and Comcast and others are really excited. So that's great, the big thing great. I see. Yeah, it's becoming real. Yep. Good. Thanks, okay. Jeff. Take it away. You bet. Okay. Thanks for hanging in, Death by PowerPoint folks. So we'll just try to make sure this is as brief as possible. Um, first of all, who knows what Redis is? I'm going to start off. Oh, oh, this is wonderful. Okay, so I don't have to spend too much time on that. So the, the Redis open source is an in-memory data structure store. We are really trying not to be a key value store. We're not just a cache anymore. This product's evolving, and you can use it as a general purpose database. So Redis Labs, we are the commercial home of Redis, and we're, all, we're the home of all of Redis because Salvatore Sanfilippo, the creator, founder, and mastermind behind Redis, uh, decided to join Redis Labs last summer. He still does exactly what he did before, which is create this incredibly high horsepower engine, but he does now uh, have a very good focus on not just building for the cool kids out on the internet, but also for enterprise uses and other use cases that we're trying to put into the engine technology itself. And then Redis Labs, uh, our relation to the Open Power Foundation, IBM uh, came to us in 2014, talked to us about it. Our founders were extremely impressed. My CTO loves this stuff because he can just, he says, as he says, it's all, I can see everything. I can see everything. And so we really love being part of the Open Power Foundation and one of the very early software companies that joined the foundation. So real quickly, just to kind of give you a, uh, an update from last year, in 2015, uh, the Gartner Magic Quadrant came out. Uh, we were excited to be in that upper right-hand quadrant there. And uh, we think that we've got something really special here with, our open, with the open source community that we have around Redis, the relationship that we have with IBM around open power, and just the momentum that we've got moving forward. So one of the things, and I just want to, I'm not going to talk a lot about my product. You can come to our booth, and I can give you everything you ever wanted to know about Redis. But I do want to point out that we do not do things exactly the way the open source does it. We add a lot of great proprietary innovative technology on top of the open source. And I'm showing you this diagram here because it really is the key to why we are so powerful when we run on Power8. And you can see that what we do is we take the open, uh, open source product, we don't touch at all the coding model around the open source product, but we break the open source databases into smaller instances or shards. And this enables us to be much more agile when we run the database. We use our cluster manager to keep track of where all the information is. This enables us to, to grow and shrink the database dynamically. And so you can see the stacks of shards that I have here in this diagram. And one of the secrets is the way that we make this thing so fast is that each one of those is going to require a CPU vCore or thread. And so this is really one of the big pieces that enables us to be so uh, powerful when we run on the Power8 platform. So it's really, uh, you know, a lot of people saying match made in heaven, and we've used that title at Interconnect and Edge. Um, the, the amount of database power that you could put onto a single Power8 box is absolutely phenomenal because of the fact that you've got this CPU that has got so much power, so many V cores and really strong, incredible capability to get to the flash and to get to the networking. So what I really want to do now is we've been talking about how cool Power is, and Power 8 is very cool. Open Power is really cool. But let's now talk, start talking about apples to apples comparison against x86. And let's talk about how customers can actually save money, a lot of money, by using a power platform with Linux instead of using an Intel platform. So I'm only picking on Dell here for comparison sakes, but you can, we're basically looking at a, uh, a Xenon processor. We're looking at very similarly priced boxes here. So the LC line gives us a very similar price point that we can compare how we're going to build a Redis Labs database on Power8 versus Intel. So we've got very similarly sized boxes, 256 uh, uh, on the RAM, same amount of flash, we got the same networking, and you'll notice the price point, the IBM system is actually slightly cheaper. And this is actually the open power created versions of this. So we've got a slightly cheaper box. Now let's take a look at the cost to host 
the hardware to run the Redis Labs software. So on the Redis Labs side, you're looking at, remember, you need one of those V cores dedicated to each one of those shards that we have on the machine. And by the way, some of those V cores need to be dedicated to Ubuntu and the application. So you can't hog them all. We can't take them all. But in this box with 256 gigs of RAM, we can build 80 shards. On the Intel side, we can only build 12. So this means that when you run out of vCores, even if you've got lots of RAM left over, you're going to need to start racking and stacking more boxes. So if you look at the price point, the number, the dollar that you're going to spend to host the hardware per shard is about $218 on a Power 8 box. It's almost $2,000 on an x86 box. So this is telling a customer, wow, this is a huge difference. Now, when we configure our product to run in a shared environment and multi-tenant, we can go up to 320 of these with the V cores that are available. So we can do 320 shards versus only 48 on the Intel side. Look at the price point difference there. So you'd think that these, the performance would be about the same given that you've got 80 versus only 12. And in fact, the performance is almost double. And this is why Redis is so popular and why Redis is blowing up. On the, on the IBM Power8 side, we can do 4 million transactions with less than one millisecond of latency. There's no other database technology on the planet that can do that. On the Intel side, it's still pretty impressive. 2.4 million operations per second with less than one millisecond of latency is still very impressive. But when you look at that number on the Power8 side, it's pretty incredible. So if I'm an IT manager or I'm a line of business manager, I'm building out my Redis Labs infrastructure, and I can look at, I have a native Redis Labs technology that's going to run right on, to, right on top of this, uh, on this Power8 and look at the cost per transaction, dramatically lower. Same thing when we also, we have a few techniques that we use to sort of cheat. RAM plus flash, we can actually use some onboard flash memory. And you can see because of the advantages are, that we have in Power8, we have a much, much faster performance. And again, a cheaper price per transaction when we use Power8. A lot of people know about Big Redis, and we were one of the first ISVs to actually use the CAPI Flash. People talk about the uh, IBM NoSQL engine. We're the engine in that NoSQL engine. It's a little known fact, uh, but you should put my logo in there somewhere. Uh, I'll have to send him a logo later. Um, so what we did is worked with IBM, and we built all the CAPI interface inter technology right into our product so that you can cheat and build incredibly large databases that don't know that it's actually using flash memory as server RAM, so that you can have incredible, incredible economy of scale. We don't use CAPI to make our product faster. We use CAPI to create incredibly large pools of server RAM that are gonna give you dramatic savings, savings that you really can't even believe. And it's so easy in our interface. You just slide a bar, you change the amount of savings that you want, and you're ready to go. And just to, to wrap up, I wanna show you what it would take to do a 40 terabyte large database using Power8 versus cloud and x86. Here is what it looks like to do a 40, a 40 terabyte database, six servers, a CAPI card, some fiber channel, and a, and a flash array. Look how expensive this is to do on the cloud. 164 servers. Bring it on-prem with x86, 80 servers. Remember, we talked about it, it was six servers. Look at that price comparison. So what, what's really exciting this year is the LC boxes on the low end when you can save an incredible amount of money and have a much more efficient database, but also at the high end for very large databases, you can do it at a fraction of the cost. Alrighty, I think I'm right on time. Oh, and coming soon, there's going to be flash right on the CAPI card itself that's gonna enable you to do up to two terabytes without having to use a flash array. And that is super exciting. I can't wait for that to come out. And we're going to have product, we're, our products going to be ready on day one. And we've got our use cases here. I've kind of run out of time, so I don't want to run over. Um, I've got, we're going to be available in the Open Power Foundation uh, pavilion to answer more questions. I thank you for your time.
Wow. Great, great job, Jeff. It just keeps getting better and better. So, Pascal, trick question time. Okay. And for those of you who stay throughout the ISV roundtable, we do have some little gifts that we can uh, give out at the end, so it's worth sticking around for. Maybe we'll make it a contest, I'm not sure. So Pascal, tell me what brought you to Open Power? Actually, there is two reasons. The first one is, as you may see from the first slide, I've got an IBM I background, and I thought that it was a good idea to introduce the IBM I asset to the Open Power community. And the second reason is, I think in our day-to-day -day job or life, we all use deduction and association. And I love the association between open and power. Very good. Thank you. Take it away. Thank you. Good morning, everyone. Right. I will talk to you today about uh, the IBM I within the open power community and what we can do with it. But before that, we may just refresh a little bit our memory. And you may know that IBM has invented the floppy disk, relational database, virtual machine Watson, and the IBM I, which is an operating system that runs on power. Next to this, for the cloud technology or the development application technology for the cloud, there is another name which is ahead of everyone else for the development, which is Salesforce. They became the number one for cloud development application in buying Heroku, which is a platform as a service that integrate also GUI designer. And they are first in the magic quadrant for the Gartner report. What they did is they reinvent, they recreate an operating system which is multi-tenant. The multi-tenancy is a fundamental asset for the cloud. Actually, it enables to share processes between connection. Like, imagine you've got an application and one guy is connected. You have then one instance of the program process maybe one instance of the database structure, and the operating system is dealing with that. If you have two connections, if you are not multi-tenant, you will have two instances, and this consumes CPU. If you are 1,000, 1 million guy connected, it matters to be multi-tenant, because you want to save CPUs. Because if not, you may use several servers, and if you need several servers, you will then need an hypervisor to link or to sync all the server, and this needs even more CPUs. Then multi-tenant is important. GUI designer, you've got several types of graphical user interface designer, text-based or visual with drag and drop mechanism. And all of, all of the GUI designer are used to create interfaces for browser, mobile, but at the end of the day, for any interfaces. Now, let's go back to the IBM I. This machine it's, has been made for business. It is robust, scalable. It's a great platform man, designed to maintain real-time business application. It can integrate many programming languages, COBOL, RPG, R, Z, major one for the business, but you also have Java, PHP, Python, Node.js that are integrated within the IBM I. And all of these are within a operating system which is multi-tenant. And we've got that since 25 plus years, exactly 28 years. Gartner also tell us that IBM Middleware is the number one in share 
within, within the market since 14 years, 14 years in a row, IBM is the number one ahead of any other competitor about business application on the middleware. The second competitor is as half of the share within the market. This is quite impressive. Then again, this is a solid machine for business and it is proven since 14 years on a row. Then we've got an excellent machine which has got a solid back end. It is multi-tenant. It could uh, deal with many languages. We've got an excellent base to be the leader for the cloud. Then why the IBM I is not leading development for the cloud? What do we miss here? This is what we will see just now. What is missing so far for the IBM I platform is to have a generic and open IDE that could integrate any GUI features, any GUI designer. You've got some of them specialized with the back-end technology, but just think about that. It will be quite impossible for an IDE to deal with all the new features coming from the Internet of Things that are created every day. Just think about what we see this week with NVIDIA. There are many new features for images, for just GUI, or modern devices, mobile or browser. Then we do not have a global IDE or a generic IDE that is available for the IBMI for this. And the old way was to have designer that were attached to the back-end technology, but today the point is to have designer that are specialized with the front-end device. And this is missing. Also, about web development, usually web interface are event-driven. And when you are event-driven, you are not automatically using a persistent application. What's the mean of persistency? Just imagine you have an application of 10 pages within a browser connected to a database. You would like your application to remember what has been done on the page one, two, three, four, five, six when you are on the page number seven. This is persistency. And on the other hand, the IBM I is very good with persistent application, but it is not even driven. It will be great to have the best of each world. About designer, there are many, plenty of designer out there. Here, I have listed some of them, but name them. You can have designer for any devices. If there is a new device that is created tomorrow, you will get a divisor for it, a designer for it. You can have generic designer, specialized designer. The point is, there are many. And uh, here, you could have seen already some of them, especially from NVIDIA, but also, also from other technology. It would be cool, it would be really, really good to be able to plug any of these designer, all of them, to any back-end application that can run on the IBM I. I mean, this would be excellent because then we will be able to merge the best of a business application with the best of the design of any user interface. Then we could have something from this good situation to this good, good, good situation, many designers. What I'm going to talk about you just now, it's about a solution, which is a bridge that would enable any designer to be plugged to any back-end application on the IBM I that runs on power. You design your GUI with any designer or framework, then this bridge solution will deploy automatically a persistent back-end application service automatically within a multi-tenant system. Then you add your business logic, and that's it. Your application is ready for the cloud. 
Just to show you an example, in any designer, and here I just took one, which is very simple, but this could be another designer for iPhone, for images. The point is you've got some code generated, either automatically or manually. The bridge solution will scan the code and extrapolate automatically all the implicit data structure that the designer require for the real runtime of your application. It will do it automatically. And then create all the back end for you. All the plumbing. You will create the HTTP server, the um, SQL server, the uh, socket server, according to your configuration. You will create a asynchronous system to enable persistency. You will also create all the shell of the program that you will have available to uh, have your application ready to be completed with your business logic. And you can connect with database or already mention which database you want to be connected with. The point is the bridge will deploy the backend as a service automatically for you. Then you just have after that to add your business logic, which is the real value of your uh, application. And then the uh, bridge solution will automatically de deploy the application to the cloud. But just look at one moment about what we see here. We've got at the end the user interface, which is event driven, which is very important for the user interface. We've got persistency, which is fundamental for enterprise application. And we've got multi tenancy, which is fundamental for the cloud. And here this is an example about the runtime. The uh, bridge solution recognizes the, the data structure and then send back the proper data structure to the application runtime. This could work for any graphical user interface framework or designer, but also for any platform as a service. And uh, with this, we can realize that we can have a new perspective for the magic quadrant because we realize now that we can plug any enterprise business application to the GPU universe, but also to the mobile universe in any shape and form. And at the end of the day, the magic quadrant will change with more power. Thank you very much. If you have any question, you can find me. I will be around, and I will be happy to uh, interact with you. Thank you. All right. So now I get two questions. Should I make this hard or not? Does the audience want to ask a question? Skill testing? No, OK. So I'll, I'll be the one. So let's start with Andrew. All right. What does Open Power need to do more of? Open Power needs, I guess it kind of leads into the presentation. It needs just more and more software applications. I think that's what we need. Developers, ourselves included, are lazy. And the easier we make things, the more stuff that's out there for us to just be able to pull down and use is really what's going to make Open Power even more successful. Great, thank you. And Adriana, mm -hmm. what would you say is the most exciting thing you've seen in the software world around Open Power? I think it's uh, the performance, the great performance that we've seen. And like Andrew was saying, right? For our job, we use tons of tools. And the faster we can get our job done, the more we can get done. And we've seen the importance of time as well. So it's very, very exciting to see right, all the results that we've come and all the tools that are ported right on the Power Platform. Great. Thanks very much. I'll leave it to you. Take all it right. away. Thank you. Hi, everybody. Uh, my name's Andrew. This is Adriana. We work for IBM. We work within the uh, Power Firmware Development Group. Um, our main job has been to write the firmware that boots all of these amazing open power systems. Um, but our journey uh, with the presentation we're doing today really started with, uh, with Minecraft. 
So I don't know how many people are familiar with that game. Uh, it's pretty popular. It's a very creative game. Um, it has a design where you have a server that's you know, basically running on a system, and then you have a bunch of clients that connect to it and play it. And so the first thing we did at IBM when we got that first tie-in Palmetto reference board was get it booted, install Ubuntu, and then get a Minecraft server running. And then we performance tested it by connecting to it and playing it while we were at work. So it was pretty cool, and it really led into us saying, wow, you know, what, what else can we do with these systems now that we've got them here uh, in our lab? So today we'll be talking about DevOps and this journey. We'll be running through two great open power systems, the Habanero from Tayan and then the HPC Firestone from IBM. So I just did a stint on the, the DevOps team for our firmware area, and I realized pretty quickly that DevOps is a very uh, charged word. There's a lot of different people using it in a lot of different ways to mean a lot of different things. So luckily, since this is our presentation, we get to tell you what DevOps really means. Um, and for us, it just broke down into three pieces. There's continuous integration, which is where you test the change from development before it gets into the master branch. There's continuous test, where you're just continuously testing that software as it's coming into, merge, into master, doing the um, functional tests, and then the continuous delivery, delivering it to the end customer, to manufacturing, to whoever that, that person is. Uh, for the demos that we're going to show you today, as Adriana said, there's, there was really two systems. Number one was the Firestone, the HPC, and that's the one described here. 20 cores, uh, 160 threads, and then it's also a part of the demos to connect over to a Habanero system, which is a single chip, but has a lot of memory. Yeah, and for the tools that we'll be covering, uh, regular tools that you'll see in the DevOps environment, Docker, Jenkins, Git, Garrett, how easy they are to set up on an open power system, and also how we've implemented them in our organization, beginning with development all the way to release, like Andrew mentioned. So the demo's really carved into two main pieces here. If you just draw a line right down the middle of Jenkins, uh, you know, the first part is really a template that anybody can use for their development environment. It uses my personal favorite tools. We've got Git Garrett, which is your source code repository and your code review tool on top of it. And then it uses Jenkins, which is a automation orchestration tool. Hands down the best out there. Uh, both open source tools. There's tons of plugins and ways to configure all of this stuff. Um, and so that'll be the, the, the first part of the demos we're going to show here. On the right side is how we've applied this within our environment with the open power systems, the open BMC. Um, and all of these are based on Docker images. So here we're showing a screenshot of Docker Hub with all the images that are available to run on power. As you can see, there's tons of them. You have your base, Ubuntu OS, you have Jenkins, you have Garrett. Most of them are saved under the PPC64 LE, so they're very easy to find. And also individuals can upload them. Uh, we've uploaded some images find Andrews under the Geissenator ID. Very unique, so we'll go from there. Um, okay. So the first demo that we're going to give here, hopefully this is all going to work out, is the initial setup of Jenkins and Garrett using the Docker images that we've, that we've created. So if you guys could hit the play button in the back there. Thanks. So we're going to run a little bit of Docker magic here. There's two Docker instances coming up here. Like I said, we've got the Geissenator, Jenkins instance, and then we've got the um, uh, Garrett, Git Garrett instance coming up as well here. Um, there's a little bit of magic on the command line there to map the ports. These are both web server tools, so you've, when you're launching Docker, you want to do some port stuff. Um, right here, we're bringing up the, the Jenkins interface. It's, it's very blank right now, which we will be filling in a little bit later, but that's your main uh, entry point. And then we've got Jenkins loading up here as well, so these are both running in those, those Docker containers. Um, Jenkins, one of the setup things we did here was to get an SSH key, because what you do is you get Jenkins to talk to your Garrett server. So as developers are pushing code, we've got a Jenkins job here, uh, a Garrett trigger, that um, this is just taking you through the configuration. It's a pretty basic configuration. It's going to run through that habanero as a, as a slave, so these jobs will get delegated off to that. Uh, at the end here, you can see we're basically just running a, a hello world type Docker image, but this is really where you, um, if you were doing, setting it up for real, you would extract the code, you would build it, you would run your automated tests, all of those things that, that Jenkins is capable of doing. 
So that was the first part. Um, the, second, the second part is now we're going to use those two instances. So if you could hit play again there in the back, please. In this case, I created a Docker image. I didn't push this one up, but basically what it does, oh, and here's actually the part. Mm -hmm. I was going to just do a for loop of five. Adriana said, hey, is, is this an open power yes. system, or is this one of those other systems? So we made it 50. We launched it. And so now we're, we're, we're shooting off a bunch of different Docker images here that are basically representing the developer. They're extracting the code. Um, they're making a change to that code base, and then they're pushing it up into Garrett. And so now you can see that Garrett is starting to fill in. Uh, we've got the different code review tools here. I do a few, a few refreshes. It's, uh, it's basically just taking the instance name of that Docker image and pushing that file up, which is how you get the title of these images. Uh, so then we go over to, to the Jenkins web interface. You can see that the, um, the Garrett jobs are being automatically detected by Jenkins. It's, each of these events in here is representing that. Uh, Jenkins has some built-in time delays to load balance the system a little bit, so that's why you see the queues uh, queuing up there. Um, in a second here, it's gonna, we're gonna go in and take a look at one of the actual jobs. Uh, you can just randomly pick one, you can look at the output, and you can see in this case that it's, it's basically executing that hello world over on the, the Habanero system. So really just a, a template for anybody that wants to go out and do a standard development environment using CI. It also can be facilitated with, with the CT and the CD, continuous test and continuous delivery uh, for this step. So now we're going to see some specific examples how we're using uh, all these tools in our organization. Uh, the first thing will be the open power firmware job. And if we hit play on the video, what this job is going to do is going to take the code from the open power firmware out of GitHub and we'll click on the job, we'll click on the output, and it's going to extract it and start compiling it. And at the end, you'll see that we'll end up with a f image, a BIOS image that you can then flash into your open power system. So here we're building the Firestone BIOS. And what this image can be used for is that we can have a different job, a test job, that can take that image, flash it into a system, and then run test suite on it. And that's what it's showing here. We're flashing a system now with the image that you built. We're going to execute a test case. Uh, first, we're going to power on the image. You'll see it's uh, booting up. Uh, we're going to get to Petty Boot uh, Prompt, which is right before the OS starts. Then Jenkins will stop the test case and report the results, in this case, success. And from there, you can continue executing right, the rest of your test suite. Very simple, very straightforward. So another example uh, that we're going to see is how we're using it for OpenBNC, and Kenneth and Addy will be talking about it in a minute. So this project, uh, if we also push play here, uh, this job, we're going to extract also the code from GitHub. So we'll go into the output console, and it's going to compile the code, and it's going to build this uh, BMC image that then you can take and flash into a system and run a test suite on top of it. So for OpenBNC, we have a full uh, test suite based on the robot framework. So this tool is also a free uh, tool that enables uh, test-driven development, and Jenkins has a very handy plugin for it, a very cute uh, robot icon in there that displays your pass rate fail. It also has links to the detailed robot logs, and you can see at a glance your test results uh, as well, so straightforward. Mm -hmm. All right, so you know, we did show a lot of our favorite tools, Jenkins, Git, Garrett, Docker. Um, I guess for completeness, I should make a, a Minecraft Docker image, but I'll, I'll get to that. But that really wasn't the point. The point is just showing how easy it is to do all of this on open power systems. And everybody else has told you all the benefits of the price and the performance and all those pieces, but really that's, that was the point of the right. first thing and we're summary, doing. You know, DevOps on open power, fast, easy, anybody can use it, transparent, try it. And you can chill on the beach at the end because it's, it's so amazing. Yeah, everything will be automated, no need to issues. And we have a last slide with uh, some reference links to the Docker Hub, to, you can get the images to run on power. Also, if you want examples of uh, build scripts and test scripts, they're all in GitHub on both the open power and the open BMC uh, projects. 
All right. Thank, thank you. you. Okay, we're hitting the home stretch here. Um, after the talks are done, which probably is another 20 minutes or so, we're gonna do community announcements and we're gonna have some time for Q&A and open questions. So now would be a really good time to tweet out to all of your friends or phone them and tell them to come in here because we've got some interesting stuff, we've got some giveaways, we've got some questions, and the chairman of the Open Power Foundation has agreed to talk to the group. So. Uh, yet another reason to, uh, to bring all your friends in. So on stage with me is Antonio, and uh, this is kind of awkward because Antonio's my boss. <laughs> so I don't know if I'm gonna ask you a really hard question, but Antonio, um, what excites you about Open Power? It's the ability to be able to take a community and innovate where you want to be. So if you wanna be in an Open Power platform or x86 or heterogeneous environment, you have a choice. And that's really what I think a community really enables, is to be able to innovate where you want to be. And so that's really excites me. There's more options, more choices to, if you want to decrease your density in the, in the data center or have more compute per node with Redis, you have the option now. Very good, thank yeah. you. Take it away. Great, great. Well, hello, I'm Antonio Rosales. I work at Canonical, the, the project uh, sponsors of Ubuntu. And I want to discuss how we can iterate faster on our ideas, because that's ultimately where we want to be able to be. So you start here. You have this idea. And it's kind of where it kind of all comes up, whether it's in the shower or whether wherever your ideas are generated. We won't, go, we won't go into too many details there. But you have this idea, and you want to get it out there in front of people and start working on it. You want to be here. You want to be looking at the analytics of your business, looking at your dashboard of your private cloud, looking at your e-commerce or just being able to actually look at to see what your application is doing if you're developing it. And you want to be able to end up here. And this is where you want your users to be able to be at, and you want to get here as soon as possible. What you, what you do as you start researching is you realize that you might have to go through a labyrinth of technologies and applications that you're going to have to figure out not only to deploy, but how to connect them and how to scale them and how to maintain them. And so you're like, I'm not, a, I'm not a particular expert at all these technologies, but I know I need to use some of these. Uh, which ones are the best ones? How do I connect them together? How do I get them to work so I can get to my idea? And so I'm here in this labyrinth, and i am still got this idea. So how do I get from here, where I started, to my idea? I have all this technology I need to be able to get to, uh, but I have this hurdle now that I still have to implement this technology to get to my idea. And so I'm focusing a lot of my energy, a lot of my time, on just getting my infrastructure up and going so I can just start iterating on my idea. I haven't even started playing with my idea yet. I'm still just stuck on the infrastructure point of view, on getting it connected, getting it, deplo getting it deployed, and getting it scaled. So um, what we want to be able to do is crowdsource the knowledge. So think of the Linux kernel. Uh, the Linux kernel is a great example of multiple people being able to come together and say, here's a great way to build a kernel, build an operating system, and they distill information into the kernel. Uh, if anyone's familiar with open source, uh, OpenStack, raise your hands. It's a private cloud, great. Another great example there, a bunch of great community members coming together and saying, hey, a good way to be able to create a private cloud is a multitude of compo components listening from authentication to compute to networking to storage. And they're distilling all the information into these services that anyone can be able to use. Not just one person or a set of people, but a whole community coming together and making that really good. Uh, anyone coming together to, de coming to deploy it can just take that set of software and deploy it and take all that knowledge the community has distilled into OpenStack. And so why can't we do that to other services? And so you see that community growing around all the Apache Foundation stuff. So Apache Hadoop, Spark, or again, being able to say, you know, what's really powerful is to go into the community and say, we have combined knowledge to be able to distill into these services. And that's been a very popular, very, you know, very successful platform to be able to distill community knowledge into these services. So what we want to be able to do is, is get you from where your idea started and go over the hurdle as far as saying, I have this infrastructure, I still got to get it deployed, the community is putting all this great stuff into it, but I still have to get up and running. 
And so we wanted to be able to think about how we can, in an open source way, be able to use that technology, deploy it, and start focusing our idea and iterating it and getting it faster out there to users. And so you end up here looking at your idea and being able to focus on what you want to be able to accomplish with that technology, whether it's mining data, whether it's being able to set up an OpenStack cloud and get out to your users. We want to get you there faster, and we want to distill that knowledge so you can be able to leverage it. Because you don't necessarily want to spend your time at deploying, you want to spend your time at using. So you end up from your labyrinth to something a little bit more executable and something a little more maintainable. So what you need is you need a rethought. You need an open source tool so you can have a common language to be able to talk with people. You need to be able to model the deployment, the life cycle, how it connects to other services, and how it scales. And so the community bootstrapped an open source, free open source project, and that's named Juju. You may have seen it earlier here, uh, and that's a service modeling tool that describes how to do these things in an open source way. So what is Juju? Juju sits on your laptop. It's a client, client tool on your laptop, and you say, hey, I want to I wanna operate on a particular cloud. That cloud could be bare metal, that cloud could be a public cloud, or that cloud could just be on your laptop. So I say, hey, I want to point out a power server cloud. You type some commands, it bootstraps into a cloud. You get an actual Juju bootstrap node running in the cloud, and it says, okay, all right, I got my Juju bootstrap node running the cloud. Your admin's still at his laptop or her laptop, and now we can start having fun. Right? Now we can say, okay, now let's start deploying some solutions out there. Get my idea out there. I, wanna, I don't have to be an expert at deploying these. I just want to get to the end result. So let's start putting some Hadoop down on an instance. All right? Let's put some MariaD, MariaDB down on another instance. Multi-node deployment, not just one, multi-node de deployment. And let's go ahead and put some Spark out there too. All right? So I got all these three in the cloud, admins typing commands at their laptop. Now we want to be able to connect those together to form a solution and scale them out. So what is the main thing we saw here is what uh, we saw from the Ghent University is uh, building blocks. You want to be able to say, how do, I, how do I model this service to be able to put it out there? So when the user comes along, they can be able to take all the good open source knowledge distilled into the application and also take all the distilled knowledge on operational knowledge to deploy, connect, and scale that service. And that's where you have here. And this is the phase change to really take note here is that in Charms, we've been trying, the community has been trying to be able to abstract away the machine, the resources side of it. So it's a service-oriented approach. It's describing how the service should be deployed independent of the resources. Why that's so critical is that it allows opportunity to have these reusable components. I can deploy these to a power architecture, to a mainframe architecture, to a cloud architecture, or to containers on your, multiple, on your laptop. Because it's abstracted away from the actual hardware, it's more focused on the service. So I can give it to anyone and say, hey, you know, if you have a set of hardware and I have a set of hardware, I don't know how your arm is set up in your topology, but we can be able to describe it here in a thing that we call a charm or a Lego block. So these build solutions. Um, here's a solution of multiple charms put together. What's really interesting is that even though it's service oriented, we can be able to work with Mellanox and be able to say, if you're on a power, open power system, you can be able to detect that and say, put down some Mellanox on there, install the drivers, get it going, and give you a performant recommended installation of that. And that's really important to users that say, hey, I want to, want to deploy a solution out there, but for my environment, I want to make sure that it's performant, recommended, without having to go through a bunch of different technologies to be able to do that. So this solution you can deploy, and it deploys on power, and it says, hey, MariaDB, I'm on power, pull down the power binaries, get it configured so it's performant, put down the Mellanox drivers there too, and connect me and give me a powerful tur turbo lamp stack, as they call it. So how do you deploy that? Again, what we're talking about is taking advantage of the operational knowledge to deploy these things. And so at the command line, it's one line, or there's a GUI, graphical user interface, to be able to deploy this one click to deploy it, and you get this running on your power systems today. So you can try this literally. It's free. It's open source. If you have a set of power machines or public cloud, you can be able to get this going right now. Another, another example of the tool that you saw up here is, again, this is a big data cluster. This is syslog analytics. You start with your Hadoop cluster. Um, you have Spark in there. You can deploy this command. And I'm not, a, I'm not a big data expert myself, but I've deployed this particular cluster multiple times in a day because it's just one click command or it's a command line to be able to enter it and get it going. So it's distilling not only the open source tools, but the way to operationally maintain and model that particular solution. What's surprising to me is I've been at the, uh, the conference and a lot of folks 
um, may not have heard of Ubuntu or just new to Ubuntu, and they have common questions like, what is Ubuntu? Well, and is it, is it sponsored by a company? It is sponsored by a Canonical, so you know it's gonna be there. They're you know, investing in it and making it better. It's also part of a very large community. Uh, a lot of folks aren't aware of that Ubuntu powers a lot of the public clouds you see out there today and a lot of the private clouds. So you'll see a lot of the, in the public clouds, you know, 60 to 70% of the Linux deployed in a public cloud is Ubuntu. Um, you know, 90% open stack clouds are built using Ubuntu. So it's very proliferant in the, in the public and private cloud space. Uh, these are a couple of the, uh, the vendors we're working with. It's a community we're building, everywhere from Tengu to you know, Redis to SkyMine to Sixwind, all those folks we're working with to be able to build a community around it. Uh, very proliferant on Apache web servers out there. So the main thing here is that it's being used, it's out there. A lot of developers are very comfortable with Ubuntu. It runs on open power, runs on ARM, runs on x86. Uh, and you have all these people in the Jiji community working to be able to make it better. So it's that community philosophy on making it better for everyone to be able to take advantage of the technology. Uh, one quick use case I wanted to step through here is you see a lot of deep learning out there. Uh, so how can you build that with Lego blocks? We start with the Hadoop core system. This is Hadoop core. It's one command to be able to deploy this. I start with Hadoop core. But that's maybe all that I want to be able to do. I want to keep building off of this. So what I can then do is say, hey, I want to add Spark. Well, I just add a relation on the graphical interface or the command line, and I add Spark over to Hadoop. Uh, what if I want some data visualization? Again, I'm not an expert at maintaining and modeling these, but I want to do these. I, want, I know what an IPython notebook is. I want to connect it into Spark. I put it on the canvas or on the command line, and I connect it over there. The operational knowledge is distilled into these charms, those Lego blocks. So what I am more concerned about is using the Spark IPython notebook and modeling my actual data mining after that. Or if I want Zeppelin change out Spark and put a Zeppelin in. They're all open source components. Anyone can be able to take them, hack on them, and change them as they like, or use this stuff right off the shelf. Um, or build your own solution. And that's where you have here is the real-time syslog analytics put together what you need for your particular use case. So that's the presentation here today. Uh, here's some links. It's an open source community, and the thing I want to be able to take away is you can try this today on an open power system, on your laptop today, free, no charge. Uh, we have an RC uh, mailing list. Give it a try today. The best way to be able to do it is just get it, try it, and see what you think. Thank you. Great. Thank you very much, Antonio. And uh, we'll have some announcements in a few minutes about different ways to get access to Power Cloud. So stick around to, for those. Um, so I'm running out of questions. And it's getting late in the morning, and everyone's thinking about lunch. Kelly, um, from your vantage point, and I think you're going to present something that we haven't heard about yet this morning, what is the most interesting place to be in open power in the community? Well, from my perspective, it will be NFE. So open power gives a very interesting platform to enable the network transformation to NFE and virtualization. And that's what I'm going to talk about. Great, thank you. Take it away. OK, thanks. So good morning. I'm Kelly LeBlanc, and I run the worldwide marketing program for Six Wind. Today I'm going to talk about boosting NFV performance on power platforms and the significance to NFV developers. So before we begin, let's first put ourselves in the shoes of these NFV developers and consider what's important to them. It's performance, cost effectiveness, and stability and support of an ecosystem. So products such as the Power Platform and software tools such as Sixwind focus on bringing this value to NFV developers. So what's this network transformation as my speech is about NFV? So ultimately, technology consumers benefit when technology evolves to offer new services or lower costs. This innovation cycle is happening faster today than ever before, and it's affecting the networking and telecom sectors more because service consumption is so high. So to stay competitive, network operators must transform their network architecture to benefit from these modern low-cost technologies. This trend involves shifting from proprietary hardware to commercial off-the-shelf servers and adopting open standards for connectivity. So network function virtualization, or NFV, I think you've all heard about this many times before, is where software applications run on standard servers to replicate systems 
And it's very popular today because it promises cost savings and flexibility. However, as we know, and you can see these for many revenue stats every quarter, hardware, proprietary hardware is still very popular. The reason why is because virtualization delivers many problems in terms of performance and scalability that have to be overcome to leverage the, before the transformation can occur. And SixWin exists to solve this challenge. As a first step, we deliver the performance required to standard servers. And as a second step, we provide performance to virtualization. So some of you may or may not be familiar with SixWin, so let me give you a quick overview. SixWin is a software company. We're headquartered in France. We have a local office here in Santa Clara, as well as in China, Japan, and Korea. We make high-performance high networking software products. And really, what we're a, uh, our mission is to make cost-effective transformation solutions for virtual networking. So we have a broad portfolio of products. We make products for OEM, so this is source code that helps OEMs develop their products. We also make software appliances that can be readily consumed by network operators directly. And for those of you in the developer community, you will be familiar with Sixwind as we are the founders of dpdk.org. As you know, dpdk has now become the foundation for high performance packet processing. So when we talk about NFV, there's two critical performance bottlenecks that bring performance actually to a crawl. And I think it's important to address these first. The first is the hypervisor. So hypervisor provides the NFV infrastructure. And this is the key enabling technology as it includes things such as the virtual switch. As the foundation for virtual networking infrastructure, the hypervisor now does many things that hardware used to do, such as routing, security, switching, multi-tenancy, et cetera. The hypervisor also needs to support performance requirements such as 10 gig, 40 gig, 100 gig. These are tremendous burdens for a hypervisor, and they require, this requires a ton of horsepower. The second potential bottlenecks are in the applications themselves. So here we're talking about the virtualized applications running on top of the hypervisor. This is because Linux drivers, things like standard Virtio interfaces, were not designed with performance in mind. Similarly, legacy software has a hard time scaling on COT servers. So at Sixwind, we have two business models to address these problems. The first I talked about earlier, this is our source code, Sixwind Gate. This is high performance packet processing software that allows our customers to build the highest performance security appliances, routers, et cetera, in a really short amount of time. It's a complete layer two through four networking stack. We offer it as modules, which can be a la carte, or you can have the entire networking stack. The second is our speed series, and this is what we've been working very closely with IBM on for power. Speed series takes the six-wing gate and packages into software appliances. For example, we have two really popular software appliances, a software router and a software IPsec gateway, and also hypervisor acceleration. So that's our virtual accelerator. So to give you some examples, for Virtual Accelerator, you can have wire speed hypervisor performance. So you can scale your hypervisor. We've shown up to 20 gigs a core, per core, depending on which platform you're using. And then for the Turbo Router, we've shown 10 gigs per core. And for Turbo IPsec, five gigs per core, scaling linearly with the number of cores. So as I mentioned earlier, we've been working with IBM for these speed series to enable high performance NFV on power. So let's talk about three use cases for NFE with power. The first is a telco operator use case for evolved packet core. Now, Sixwind has been selected by many 4G network equipment providers for EPC equipment for many years. And this is to unlock hidden performance in the COT servers. The trend is to virtualize with NFE the EPC applications to run them on top of a hypervisor. However, this adds many layers as we talked about that many layers between the network interface and the application workload running in the VM, which can slow performance to a crawl, causing many performance bottlenecks. As a result, in some specific cases, consumers can't benefit from the true cost effectiveness of virtualization, and they'll need to default back to specialized hardware. So six twin speed series running on power actually overcomes this problem 
by accelerating the hypervisor, whereby the EPC applications are running on top of a hypervisor that's designed for wire speed performance. In this case, you have an NFV EPC example where performance can actually outpace traditional hardware solutions. The second example is for cloud providers. So here we're taking an example where virtualization is helping cloud services by allowing replication via VM density. So let's take this example. You have two VMs with the right amount of performance to, ha to have established service level agreements. However, when we try to increase the service density, you, we run into some problems. Once again, in this scenario, Virtual Accelerator can accelerate the hypervisor to give two key benefits. We can either increase the amount of VMs that are running on the same hypervisor, or we can boost the performance for each of the VMs directly. The end result is more services and more revenue on the existing infrastructure. And my third and last example today is for OEMs and network operators who are transitioning from physical to virtual network appliances. So I talked earlier about our six Wingate source code that has been helping network operators and OEMs for many years develop high-performance routers, high-performance security appliances. Now we're enabling the transition to NFE where that same functionality can be virtualized. To give you some example, we're always doing performance benchmarks. For one example, I told you earlier, we've been doing five gigabits per second of IPsec throughput in a virtualized appliance, scalable linearly with a number of cores. So if you can imagine, you assign 30 cores with five gigabits per second per core, and you get 150 gigabits per second in a virtualized environment with a combination of turbo IPsec and virtual accelerator. This is tremendous performance to offer customers allowing the transition to virtualization without sacrificing performance. So in conclusion, SixWind offers an entire ecosystem of cost-effective and, flex cost and flexible migration solutions for NFE. However, we always warn users that while cost savings and flexibility are promised, you have to be sure to be mindful of the performance bottlenecks, otherwise they won't be realized. So, We've been working with Power and IBM for several months now to re replicate the performance and scalability of, of proprietary hardware on the Power platforms in virtualized environments. So today we discussed three different ways that you can realize NFE with Six Wind and Power. The first is to scale your hypervisor. The second is to leverage throughput for 